Good evening, everyone. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to tell you about uh, AI and voice first, which is a, a topic that everyone is talking about, especially at the CES. Uh, so let's dive in. But first, let's make sure this, no, this doesn't work. There we go. So let's talk about exponentials. We're going to hear a lot about exponentials in the coming years because we are the cusp of this acceleration. You all know about the Moore's law. Moore's law is basically doubling computing power every 18 months, but it's maybe slowing down on, this, on the chip level, but it's accelerating elsewhere. So big data is somewhere also at the tangent point. Personally, I'm not impressed by big data because I've been consuming data for the past 30 years because I started coding 30 years ago. So big data is a function of how much data we can capture, how much data we can process. Right? And it's exponential today because everything is converging. We can capture that data, we can process it quite fast. So, you know, 20 billion records per day, that's huge. Uh, it's hard for human beings to comprehend that number. So, let's simplify, let's call it Moore's Law going forward. Now, there's another curve called Darwin's Law. It's flat. This is us. And I don't know if you can feel it personally, and again, I'm not necessarily impressed by big data because I, I sense it and I, and I see it evolving quite naturally, but within my guts, I feel that there is a rupture. It's going faster and faster, and it's much harder for us poor human beings to comprehend, to assess, to imagine the power of, of that particular exponential. So we're gonna talk about solutions down the line, but this is, this is where we are today and this gap is going to get bigger and bigger, and it's going to be more complicated for human beings to comprehend. Now, here's another exponential, and you know this one pretty well. 1990s, no connected device at home, right? We're talking about the PC, personal computer era. Now, 1995, the first computer was connected, and already you started to have a sort of notification effect. You remember AOL? You've got mail. The computer is starting to address you directly. Then 2005, mobile, the explosion of the BlackBerry, also known as the CrackBerry. <clears throat> CrackBerry means that you get notified every single time of the day. And so, you know, working patterns start to evolve as well. IoT, this is now. I don't know about you, but I checked at home. I have 25 IP addresses allocated on my home network. Between the tablets, the phones, and the connected speakers, that's 25 devices. I'm probably above the the average, but that's gonna get much higher. Because by 2030, we will have 100 billion connected devices. That's only 10 devices per individuals, if we have 10 billion human beings connected. So that's gonna get really complicated. And this is a problem too. Imagine what's gonna happen when all of these devices solicit your attention to be configured, to be, you know, they notify you because they want your attention for something. So that's what the analysts predict, about 27 or 29 devices per smartphone, which is a sort of personal hub. And that's interesting because you can see dynamics here. And finally, another problem, a side of the problem, which is this crazy triangle where every single of these entities is trying to pull the data towards themselves. Data and AI. Corporations have access to a lot of data and AI. States are getting there, rapidly catching up. And the small guy at the top who's trying to maximize personal options has very little access to those tools and, and their own personal data also. So the center of gravity is centered towards the bottom. And I'm talking to our VC friends in the room, you know, you will also participate in this effort to balance or unbalance this equation by pushing for data-hungry companies to thrive on personal data. So we see these as actual problems uh, in the equation. Now, <clears throat> voice-first IoTs is a new thing. Even though a lot of companies have tried to build interfaces using voice in the past, it's happening now, and it's getting better and better. Uh, so for us, this is a new, new HMI frontier. That's the human-machine interaction. Picture this, computers, for the past 30 years, personal computers, you had to learn how to use MS-DOS and then the mouse. That was hard. I see parents nowadays saying, you know, my kid is a genius, uses the iPad better than I do. 
And they say, no, the genius is you, the parent, because you've had to learn to use computers. Kids don't have to learn to use computers. They're natural. Now, the natural evolution is, of course, much more natural interfaces. So voice is the ultimate natural interface. Or other sorts of interactions that are gesture-based. So voice is, is coming strong, and you can perfectly see where it fits well. When you have your hands on the wheel, well, you can talk to your car and say, take me to my next meeting. Or, you know, let's, uh, let's make the temperature a little better. So these are natural commands. And the car is a connected device. It's an IoT. And of course, all these devices are coming next. Between toys and speakers and vacuum cleaners, Amazon Alexa is what everyone is talking about today. They are creating a new market. And at the CES, everyone was talking about them. We're working with them because it's simple to plug into. And so as a result, there are 3,000 companies working to build new skills into Alexa. Alexa to Google by storm. So Google is catching up rapidly. Okay? There's going to be Apple down the line as well, and others. But the point is, this is a new platform coming up. And think about the app stores, how the app economy built up about 10 years ago. Well, this is the next stage. And you can see in the numbers, this is the number of devices being sold. It's another exponential. And everyone is going to participate in this, in this particular game. Now, let's talk about voice and the complexity of voice. Hundreds of companies have, work in, have worked in NLP, natural language processing. Now, this field is relatively simple when everything is in the sentence, when everything is in the query. The query is called self-contained. It's a shallow query. So if I ask, what's the weather in London? Well, even Siri can answer that. Now, the next one, I'm going to do a little test with you guys, right? It's a test of actual intelligence. Find me an Italian near my Airbnb in London. Now, this is a complex query. It's called a deep query. And so I'm going to solicit your brain. Are you ready? The question is to find an Italian person or an Italian restaurant. Brilliant. OK, you solve this because you have the ability to recontextualize the query. So this, this query is actually very complex. The action is simple. Already, you have to find out that this is a restaurant that you're looking for. And once you know that, you still don't have enough context. So what you do is you look up at the rest of the sentence. But here, it's another ambiguity, right? The question is not to find the address of the Airbnb office in London. It's to find the one that I'm referring to for myself, the one I booked a month ago. So once you start to understand the complexity and the context of the language, you can start solving it in a way that is accurate and useful. Right, so the point is you have to tap into emails, so that means you have to understand emails and find it in London, find the address of that particular Airbnb, and then solve it for Foursquare. So language is actually very complicated, and NLP is a field, again, that has been used for, you know, for 30 years, has been evolving quite well, but NLP only means natural language processing. The new frontier is NLU, natural language understanding. So this is where computers have a hard time. Now, there's a platform war out there, and you know the usual suspects, the GAFAs. Wrong order, but you get the point. And Microsoft also. Um, these guys, they have tremendous data. And they are able to build a lot of systems. But what they want to do is build a private ecosystem uh, within which they can build on. And then you have other players that have managed somehow to build on top of these ecosystems. And so you can find Facebook and Messenger and WeChat. They are trying to bypass the OSs. They don't have an OS per se, but they are building on top and inviting developers to build additional value into the ecosystem. But let's be very clear, these are closed systems. Now, when you work with companies like that, that have a centralized database that manipulates a lot of personal data, you get issues. What happens when our connected homes, our connected cars, our connected TVs start shipping everything we say to a server in Seattle. Right? It's, it creates a sovereignty problem for the countries. It creates uh, an issue with individuals who may feel, again, that advertising is manipula manipulating them too much. So that's a problem. And people are actually very concerned. People say, oh, Generation X, Y, they don't care. That's not true. 
They do care. If given a choice, they will prefer a solution that protects their privacy. So this is where we, we step in. So our vision, the top line vision, is really to help make technology disappear, to make it such that it feels natural again. Technology has a long history. You know, the wheel was invented a long time ago, and it feels natural. It doesn't feel intrusive. It's very good. Electricity, major breakthrough. We get in to a room, we just flick the, the switch, and it works. So why should this technology be any different? Well, this technology is AI. And AI, it turns out, is on a much faster exponential. So if you have a problem in red and a solution in blue, and you subtract one by the other, you get this curve, which is the reduction of friction. Friction is everything between it's complicated to use and I, I have issues with using it. So if you remove friction, it means everyone is okay to use it and works well, reliably. So this is why we're an AI company and we're gonna build up on that. Now, our approach is to actually rebalance this a little bit. So we are very, very strong in, in the aspects of privacy because this is the only way to actually rebalance the equation, giving it a, bit of, a little bit of AI to individuals and not so much to corporations that at some point will, will pass a threshold. So our product is an AI platform for voice-first objects. And we're doing it in a way that is open source on device, private by design, uh, so that there is maximum transparency maximum uh, adoption. So how does it work? Well, you can see this, this flowchart. It's pretty simple. We can start with speech, which comes from voice or text, because as I said, um, NLP is, is solved today. And transcribing voice to text is also pretty simple. The problem is comprehending the query. So once you have this text, we have our NLU, which is really what we build on. And then you have skills, which will make sure that the sentence or the query is understood in a very specific context. And then once you have the action, you can loop back and talk again to the, to the user. And next to that, we've built a bunch of services to allow to deploy and, uh, and generate revenue on top of the main engine. So how does that work? Well, we're using deep learning. So deep learning is a, is a, is a type of AI, which using neural networks. And traditionally, NLP has been using different technologies, much more like graphs, trying to, to break down language. A neural network is much more intuitive in a way. It's, it looks like the, it, it's, it's, it's mimicking the way the brain works so that it can make sense out of complexity. And what we've done is actually work from a very small set of queries. Let's say you want to build an assistant for a car, then you can set, okay, um, you know, close the windows and uh, increase the temperature. These are two queries. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take these two queries and then we're gonna paraphrase them in a multi multiplicity. So we end up with 300 ways of saying the same thing. Once we have that, we get to the essence of the language by augmenting it as well. And then we train the models so that we get a model that is universally good at solving these, these queries. And so our approach is quite novel because it, it's not massively connected to a lot of data like the GAFAs would have. So we wanted to test our performance compared to other providers. And so here, for instance, at Google, you have API.ai, um, and um, Apple, we just test their, their own mo module. Microsoft is using Lewis, so it's, a, it's, a, it's another API. And so we compare very well. Precision and recall are two data science terms to actually find out whether the query works reliably and repeatedly. And our goal is to actually maximize and be in the top right. So we're doing pretty well, but some queries are more complex than others. And our system runs on pretty much all the platforms, but we're focusing on IoT. So the goal is really to make sure that it works really well on very small CPUs. Now, this is the usual two by two, and we chose the axis so that SNPs is in the top right. Huh? Of course, um, it's fair to say. But the point is really closed source, open source, and, uh, and private on device versus cloud. And clearly being in the cloud makes all the difference. It's a single point of failure when it comes to your personal data. What we wanna do is make sure that whatever we're building runs 
locally inside the device itself. So it's self-contained. So if you compare to Alexa, we are really at the opposite spectrum. Alexa is really a cloud-based, uh, e-commerce driven uh, company, so that makes sense. Google is pretty, pretty similar. Uh, and our, our approach is radically on the other side. Also looks like a component. Uh, so we're coining the term called AI as a, comp as a component. So you know SaaS, software as a service. Well, this is AI as a component because precisely it looks and feel like it's a chip. It could be embedded in a chip because it's self-contained. So our licensing scheme is very simple. And of course, this approach is also forward compliant with a number of institutions, including the HIPAA for medical devices, but most importantly, GDPR, which is coming strong in 2018. So pretty, pretty much every single organization that deals with data in Europe, including GAFAs doing business in Europe, will have a headache to try and comply. CNIL has been nice so far. This is gonna cost a, a lot of fines down the line. So it's really hard to work with personal data in the future. So our typical partners will be B2Bs, working on actual devices, IoT startups, because they want to move forward faster and have less dependencies, and the makers. The team is based in Paris, mostly. Uh, the three founders, Rand, um, Mael, and Michael. I'm the one without the PhD background. Um, but I do, I do code. I've been coding for the past 35 years, actually. Um, and so this, this team of founders is highly technical. Uh, so we have PhDs in machine learning and uh, bioinformatics and mathematics, uh, repeat entrepreneurs. And the team is 41 people strong, based in Paris, mostly again. We have people in New York, a small team, and in San Francisco. So perhaps a slight aparte on uh, French tech, because I know uh, this, being, this is being taped and seen in the US, so if I may, yeah, uh, with your permission, because Xavier is, uh, is very active within France Digital. So France Digital is a lobby that publishes a barometer every year. And it's worth, so this is the English edition, if you see this link. And so the, the numbers are staggering. I mean, France is a country that has pretty bad press, but you need to look at those numbers to see what's happening within the ecosystem. It's exploding. It's on its own exponential, right? If the French economy is growing at 1% at best, our ecosystem is growing at 25% to 39% yeah. every year. Double digit year on year for the past five years. So it's really, it's really happening now. And also for a bit of education on the salaries, well, this is the typical breakdown of a typical job in France. When we negotiate with salaries, we talk about gross salary, and the cost to the company is this much. Now, in a company that is called Innovative, you can shave off a little bit of that company cost because it's, the, the government will give you tax breaks on that. But furthermore, if you're doing an R&D, if you're doing R&D, that particular job is gonna cost you a lot less because you get further tax cuts. And if you compare to the very same job, let's say a PhD in machine learning, three times the price to the company cost. So this is quite interesting for a company based in France, very ambitious, looking to conquer the world, but still do R&D in France, where we do have talent that is three times cheaper than the US. You know, smart money should invest here for companies that, in that profile. So you can take the time to read this uh, offline, but basically we do work hard. Uh, you know, there are a lot of fallacies. We cannot fire people. That's not true, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So this is more for people to read down the line. So this is us. Feel free to, to tweet this presentation. That's it. Thank you very much, Ian. Yeah.